Greetings, everyone. My name is Amy Banks, and I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar, Campus Public Safety, A Closer Look. This webinar is being hosted by the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Safe and Healthy Students in collaboration with the Readiness and Emergency Management for Schools, or REMS, Technical Assistance Center. This webinar is designed to provide an in-depth review of the A Closer Look section on campus public safety as put forth in the Obama administration's recently released Guide for Developing High-Quality Emergency Operations Plans for Institutions of Higher Education. This new guide, along with the Guide for Developing High-Quality School Emergency Operations Plans, was developed by Ed in collaboration with the U.S. Departments of Homeland Security, led by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, the Department of Justice, led by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or FBI, and Health and Human Services. They represent the culmination of years of work by the federal government. And now I'd like to turn it over to my colleagues from the REMS TA Center. Sean? Thank you, Amy. Before we begin, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Our call today is set so that only our presenters can speak to the group. However, we will be taking questions. You may submit your questions at any time during the webinar using the online Q&A chat function located on the lower right side of your screen. Our presenters will respond to questions during the Q&A session at the end of the training in the order in which they were received and as time permits. Just above the Q&A chat window on your screen, you will see a file share pod that contains a downloadable PDF of today's webinar slides. Please click on the file name and then click on the Download Files button to save the webinar slides to your computer. Let's get started. Today our presenters are Calvin Hodnett, Senior Management Analyst at the U.S. Department of Justice, Office of Community-Oriented Policing Services, and Vicki Weaver, the Director of Public Safety at Ryder University in New Jersey. Calvin was part of the interagency working group that developed the guides. He has extensive special project experience and is currently responsible for developing training and technical assistance for school-based law enforcement nationwide. Prior to joining the COPS office, he held positions with the Department of Public Safety and the State University of New York and at Northeastern University. Vicki Weaver began her career with Ryder University as a senior officer and was promoted to director in 1993. She is responsible for the public safety of two campuses, coordinates the university's emergency preparedness and response, serves on several university committees to include the Student Affairs Leadership Team and Ryder University Veterans Association, and has also served as an adjunct instructor. Vicki previously served as a military police officer and investigator in the U.S. Army. As, uh, in the US Army. Vicki was recently elected president of the International Association of Campus Law Enforcement Administrators, or IACLEA, and began, in, and began her term in July 2013. Vicki also served on the 2007 New Jersey Campus Security Task Force. She earned her CPP, Certified Protection Professional, certification from ASIS in 2005. She has made presentations locally and regionally on various topics related to campus law enforcement. And now we'll begin the presentation. Calvin? Thank you, Sean. I appreciate that. Thank you, Amy, for that introduction also. We're glad, um, Director Weaver and I are glad to be here today to talk about this topic, and we're going to get right into it. You know, securing our campus, which is campuses which are faced with so many emergencies, which range from you know, active shooters to fires, tornadoes, earthquakes, and pandemic flu is by no means no easy task. Many, many of uh, these emergencies occur with little or no warning, and therefore it's critical for institutions of higher education to plan ahead to help ensure the safety and, well, and great general welfare of all members of the campus community. Whether they're natural disasters, earthquakes, tornadoes, as I said, pandemic flu, or accidental or mechanical issues, such as explosions or hazardous materials of power outages or fire, or even human uh, incidents such as active shooter or, or arson or bomb threats. We will focus on some of these issues today, but we will talk in general about how important it is to secure our campuses and the role that campus law enforcement can play in emergency management and in, at our universities. 
obviously, as Amy talked about, all the information that we had today will be coming from the Guide for Developing High Quality Emergency Operations Plans for Institutions of Higher Education. And required, and because of these guys, we're going to, it's going to require a lot of new strategies for law enforcement to be able to do what they do. But I think the ongoing partnerships and collaboration that we have on campus will definitely allow us to be able to do those things. We at the Department of Justice are definitely pleased to be asked to be to have been asked to be a part of this working group that developed the guides, along with the Homeland Security and the Health and Human Services and Education. The process itself was a great process to work through our language differences and concerns, and we think that these guides really will go a long way to help campus law enforcement and campus public safety. So as we focus on campus public safety today in particular, we'd like to, I'd like to definitely lose the resources, the Department of Justice itself, but also the COPS office, the FBI, and the Bureau of Justice Assistance, who is working nationwide with our partners like IACLEA and the new National Center for Campus Public Safety to assist local and tribal law enforcement and emergency managers. Today we're going to talk about four distinct things. First, we're going to talk about the characteristics of campus public safety. And then Director Weaver will talk about the role of in, our role of emergency manager and the partners that we must have to make emergency management work on our campuses. And then we'll finish up with the resources that are available. There are so many different data points out there. We just decided to take one small one. This is in this data point here are the individual agencies who reported to the UCR, the University Uniform Crime Report that the FBI has, and it's just a small um, um, inkling of just some of the bigger problem that we have. Statistically, we know that our campuses in the U.S. remain as relatively safe places for our faculty, staff, and students, but violent crime on campus continues to and Violent crime on campus continues to generally be a rare event, and it seems that imp in even incidents of on-campus property crime are beginning to also fall. This is generally due to increase, I believe, the increase of on-campus and off-campus collaboration between uh, all our different apartments. The composition of our, of our um, institutes of higher education across the United States are are myriad, are very diverse. While we have them in urban and suburban and rural settings all across the country, we know that there are over 1,400 community colleges, that there are over 4,000 traditional schools, and it's in about an 80-20 split between public and private uh, between that 4,000. But we also know that there is a large influx now of nonprofit schools and for-profit schools, and we are, that's the next realm of things that we will have to start to understand how safety affects them. And we also know that our that IHEs are becoming more of a community resource, that as they continue to grow, they become more of a place where they provide wraparound services, so not only to the students on campus, but also to the community at large, from daycare to wellness to K-12 through schools on campus to holding community meetings. You start to see that as they are involved with um, uh, the cradle to grave of different incidents, uh, different um, institutions around, from hospitals to even some of our campuses even have cemeteries on them. So campus police departments fall into four generally, diff four generally different scopes. One is the full-time sworn agency, which generally enforce most federal, state, and local tribal laws and are employed by the IHE. What they really makes them distinct is in general they are at larger institutions and at larger public institutions in general. What they really make them distinctive or even more is that they hold so many major facilities, such as arenas and hospitals and research. You know, campus public safety has come to a point that it really come, came about because they, they, we needed an opportunity, a way to provide a quicker response to incidents on campus, and the, it became too much of a burden on off-campus um, resources to be able to cover those things. You, you, if you can imagine, if there was no campus public safety at most of the universities that we have, the amount of resources that would be needed from the surrounding community would be overwhelming to them, especially at our larger institutions, with, which have nearly a year-round student population equal to or greater than the population of the community that they were within. On-campus facilities temporarily can increase the population in a community from a 90 to 115,000 people, and that's just on any given Saturday in the United States. And if you put that beside all the other materials and things that's happened, larger police departments, these larger fully sworn organizations are really a big part of what's going on around the country. 
The other, second one that really is becoming is really prevalent is those with security departments, which really are non-sworn officers. Most a lot of them are at your private universities. They generally are employed full time by the by the IHE and really rely on local and state law enforcement for support through MOUs. Um, generally, they do not have arrest powers, but they may have the power to detain because they are working with private property. The third and fourth way that we see campus law enforcement working is uh, in contract security, where IHEs contract with a private firm. And generally, they still rely on local and state law enforcement for support. Though they may be armed, they most likely are not. The other and last uh, last way that we commonly see campus law enforcement is through local and state and tribal police and through a memorandum of understanding through local local means, which basically is a drop-in where people just come in and they just stop by and see how people are, which is great community policing. So as we know, obviously, there's also a lot of hybrid organizations where they could be all of these things and a combination of, the, of them. There's a lot of campus police organizations, campus public safety agencies around the country who not only have uh, full-time sworn but also non-sworn officers on the same campus. I want to share with you three, a couple of examples of universities that have in, in the kind of uh, diversity that they have. If you go to the Virginia Commonwealth University, which is based in Richmond, Virginia, which is a very large public institution with over 32,000 students, they are based on 140 acres in the middle of the city of Richmond. They are run by a chief of police who reports to the vice president for administration, and he has over 90 full-time sworn officers and over 200 non-sworn officers, making them one of the largest police departments uh, at a IHE within the country and uh, on scale with being one of the larger police departments even in the United States. Their most biggest threats and hazards is obviously work, working in an urban environment, but also their medical center and research becomes a, a definite issue for them. Another school that we want to talk a little quickly about is called Lamar Community College, which is based in Lamar, Colorado. They're a public institution based on the Colorado State System of Community Colleges, and they don't even have a full-time full campus public safety department. The director of facilities there uh, is in charge of public safety, and, and he has a part-time worker who goes and makes sure that all the doors are locked and things like that in the evening, and he operates under a local MOU. He only has, in general, about 700 students who even go to the university. But what's really uh, interesting about this, this college is that 300 of those live on campus, as we see a lot more community colleges having on-campus facilities now, on-campus residential facilities. And as being on 109 acres, he definitely is taking a, using a lot of space. And then natural occurrences of, uh, of uh, tornadoes, and their, their isolated location really becomes one of the threats and hazards that they have to work with. The last one I want to talk about really quick is Pepperdine University, which is a large private university, which is in Malibu, California. Their, their, their director of public safety is also an associate vice president. And while they have only 8,000 8, students, they cover almost 830 acres. Their main threats and hazards there are really natural in, in general. They are, because they're in California, they're, they're susceptible to earthquakes and wildfires. And because they're also next to the Pacific Ocean, they now become and have to be ready for tsunamis at the same time. So there you get, you start to see the diversity of things that on-campus emergency managers have to be prepared for and how it's so important to be ready for these things. Because when you don't have a plan, you start to understand that without a plan, there are a lot of crushing obligations that start to get in the way and, and can sidetrack you from your mission, which is to educate students. And after that crushing obligation, there's the, the aftermath of it, which can happen without a plan. What you see here is a picture of the aftermath of, what, of the national media attention that came to Virginia Tech after the shooting there. And what you also see with what would happen without proper planning for, and what the things that can happen with that. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn it over to Director Weaver, who's going to talk a little bit more about the role that, that campus law enforcement can play in emergency management. Thank you, Calvin. Um, it's just to give a little uh, more perspective to, to the makeups of our campuses. Uh, my institution, for example, is a private institution. Uh, I'm the senior administrator for our department. And we employ full and part-time non-sworn officers. We have over 5,000 students um, represented from 69 countries. 
we also have two campuses located about nine miles apart. And some of our threats and hazards that we take a look at is that we're located near an airport. And with our Lawrenceville campus, we're adjacent a major highway. So when you look at campuses, you, know, uh, you don't just look at the typical threats. You also have to look at for um, other events that could happen, such as if you're in a flight path, you may want to consider uh, making sure you include a policy procedure for downed aircraft, for example. So you want to use that all hazards uh, approach. Now, there's a, a good um, key here that goes over the steps in the planning process for developing your emergency operation plan. And as I just said, um, you want to consider possible hazards that could take place. The planning process, no matter what kind of institution that you have, or your, your, your makeup, the planning process is still the same. However, each hazard has its own unique traits that must be taken into consideration. So the first step we look at is forming a collaborative planning team. That's members from within the institution. They'll, you'll go ahead and you identify your core planning team, form that framework, make sure you define and assign roles and responsibilities, and uh, make sure you follow up by scheduling meetings. Step two, in an assessment of risk, we recommend the campus's plan for the possibility, not the probability, of this risk. And after completing step two, the planning team has a prioritized list of threats and hazards, whether they're high, medium, or low risk, based on the results of the risk assessment. When we move over to step three, the planning team will have at least three goals, such as before, during, and after, for each threat or hazard and function, as well as objectives for each goal. This directly leads to the identification of courses of action in step four, and we see in step four, the course of action designed for your IHE may be unique to other courses of action. The unpredictability of a serious incident requires consideration of your facility's individual makeup, whether doors lock, the size of the facility, the age of the students, and so forth. And in addition, we encourage every campus as part of that plan development to create a threat assessment team if they have not already. This threat assessment team, sometimes referred to as a TAT or TAT, has a primary function of assessing information gathered and developing threat management strategies for persons of concern. And we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail um, later. If we move to st step six, this is where you seek to improve the, uh, you seek to implement the plan through training and exercises. Each campus will need to find effective ways to discuss and demonstrate the concerns about the various hazards and how to respond. How to discuss each hazard depends on the age of the audience. For example, few college or university students would not know about Columbine, Virginia Tech, or Newtown and most would have experienced severe weather incidents or no, know of recent national natural disasters such as Superstorm Sandy. And certainly along the, uh, the north, northeast, um, you know, we just went through Superstorm Sandy recently. So you know, we, we've gone through the experience. We um, implemented our plans. Uh, once things were over and start to settle, we had an opportunity to go back and review and return to uh, a sense of normalcy. Let's look at the role of campus public safety. Campus public safety has many responsibilities. Um, we need to make sure that we develop procedures for reviewing and updating our higher ed EOP. We need to make sure we develop procedures for facilities and equipment, including testing those systems, very, very important. Make sure that we develop procedures for mobilizing Department of Public Safety personnel and pre-positioning resources and equipment. We also want to make sure we have that process in place for managing incidents using that ICS NIMS format. Make sure we develop a process for communicating with and directing Central Dispatch Center. 
if you do have an emergency contact list, and we encourage that, you, encourage that you do, you may need to activate that list. And also it's important that uh, all of us participate in the threat assessment team. Now when we talked about checking systems, um, it's important that we do this on a regular basis. We want to check our systems for readiness. This includes systems such as our alert notifications, our fire alarms, surveillance cameras, card access, blue lights, and other, any other systems for which public safety has responsibility. It's also important, too, when we talk about collaboration, that we work with our facilities partners to make sure that they regularly test emergency backup generators, portable lighting, and other types of equipment. And following that ICS format, it's really important, too, that all responders speak plain language in order to avoid confusion or miscommunication. Let's take a look at additional considerations. Do your plans, or have you considered, evacuation annexes, evacuating out, or maybe having to do a reverse evacuation, depending on the type of emergency that you're experiencing? And how about lockdown procedures for, for buildings or specified locations? And we recognize the challenge that we have for lockdowns on college university campuses sheltering in place, making sure we do accountability. Communication is key, not just internally, but also with our external partners. And do we have continuity of operations? How do we recover? How do we continue in the face of an emergency? Let's also make sure we cover, we cover the uh, recovery phase as well. And also, let's not uh, forget public health, medical, and mental health. Keep in mind that all institutions of higher ed, regardless of the size, need to be aware of the student or community member who becomes violent for whatever reason. We need to make sure that we've got our internal partners in place. The IHE guide has information on each of these topics as a functional annex to your institution's EOP. Functional annexes focus on critical operation functions and the courses of action developed to carry them out. As the planning team assesses the institution's needs, it may need to prepare additional or different annexes. And while these functions should be described separately, it's important to remember that many functions will occur consecutively. In looking at the campus public safety efforts, what we look at are things such as promising, best, promising practices and the lessons learned, tabletop exercises to improve response reactions. Some have attended the alert training session, which is the advanced law enforcement rapid response training uh, with very favorable feedback. Moving on to partners in emergency management. Let's look at our campus stakeholders. And this is not an all-inclusive list, but in preparing your EOP, preparing for an event, an incident, it's important that you reach out to uh, many of these departments and probably others that aren't listed on here, to go ahead and determine what type of EOPs, annexes, sections of your EOP you need to develop. So you see that we've included academic affairs, central senior administration, public safety facilities, human resources, health services, information technology, public information office, student affairs, residence life, and it hits all facets of our communities, faculty, staff, students, and visitors. Internal collaboration. Emergency planning, preparedness, response, and recovery is an institutional responsibility. So those departments, divisions that I just identified in the previous slide should be included in 
plan development and preparation response and recovery regarding incidents occurring on the campus. So what to do if it happens? IHE EOP should include courses of action to most effectively respond to all hazards. Again, the all hazards approach. We need to make sure we teach and train on these practices as deemed appropriate by the IHE to minimize the loss of life. And then also, we've got to make sure that we train our staffs to overcome denial and to respond immediately, including fulfilling their responsibilities for individuals in their charge. You know, one of the most important things to do following an incident, you know, a lot of people put focus before the incident and planning, um, preparing for. But equally critical is the after action review. All responders need to respond to an incident, uh, who respond to an incident need to participate in the after action review as soon as possible following an incident. The discussion should include what worked well, what did not work as planned, lessons learned, and how if the plan should be revised. So at this point, Calvin, I'm going to go ahead and turn the floor back over to you to talk about our local partners. Great. Thank you, our Director Weaver. Um, as we develop our on-campus partners, it becomes necessary also to develop our external local partners. I think uh, quite often um, the campuses may find themselves separated from their outside partners but then need them when it comes to emergency management. So like most things, it is better to find out who you need to partner with beforehand instead of waiting for the emergency to actually happen. There are local law enforcement agencies that surround us and those even there's a little further away that we should work to partner with. There's our first responder agencies, which is our fire and our EMS, which inevitably we always have some kind of interaction with. Remember, in general, a lot of times your fire, local fire department is your, your designated local emergency, um, emergency manager. Also, you need to understand that you play a part, the, university, the campus itself plays a part in the local, county, state, and federal emergency management, that those local emergency managers may be even looking forward to your facilities to use them for shelter, for, for evacuation, for other, other things in their existing plans. And they may not even understand the plans that you have in place if you haven't had those conversations with them. The other thing that you need, really need to get ahead of is you need to have an opportunity to sit down with your local recovery agency, such as the local Red Cross and other things, so that you know if incident was to ever happen on your campus, where could your students go? To, as, a, as a local shelter if something was to happen on campus. I myself was involved at a early, in my early career at, the, at a college at New Paltz in the State University of New York. At one point, we had a, a whole residence hall that was contaminated with PCPs, with PCP. And now the challenge became that we had to evacuate that whole hall, and now we had to figure out where we were going to put all the, a whole hall were for all female students, 400 stu female students, and we couldn't use that building for a year. So that became a large problem that we didn't, obviously there was really, not obviously, but there really was no plan for it, but we had to make it work. So local partners are very important. As we keep going forward and we start to wrap up this part of the session, we start to see that our resources that are available to us on the campus law enforcement side, obviously our number one, one of our resources is IACLEA, which um, Director Reaver is the current president of. Uh, IACLEA is the International Association of Campus Law Enforcement Administrators. They've been around for, since 1958, I believe, and have almost 1,200, over 1,200 colleges and universities in 20 countries that are members there. They really are a great support for member and non-member resources that are available there. The other resource is the college, University and College Police section of the IACP. Um, which is a great resource. They're very similar to IACLEA, and the membership is almost the same. But the power of, I, of IACP is a little different than the power, the power of IACLEA and what their, their purposes are. So both of them play an important part. Uh, from the Department of Justice, I'll continue to talk that the COPS office where, I'm a, where I work at is uh, great. We have a lot of school and campus safety resources that are available to the field. 
and also the Bureau of Justice Assistance has a lot of campus resources, including just uh, funding the National Center for Campus Public Safety, which is going to be built as a current shop for to be able to connect campus public safety to all the innovative practices and training technical assistance and other things that are needed by the field, including uh, data and other things that are so needed by the field. The other thing which we talked a little bit about is that the FBI is a resource in the field itself, and you can contact your local FBI office. But they also they've developed a, an active shooter incident web page that you can also get information on. All right. That's, that continues this part of the presentation. I guess this part is on Amy to uh, to jump back in here. Well, uh, uh, this is oh, Sean. Sean. Um, it's time for, for the Q&A session. We'll, we can now take a few questions from our participants. Um, remember, if you have a question, to pose it using the Q&A chat function on the lower right side of your computer screen. This is Amy. We do have um, a question. Uh, first of all, it says, is there anything uh, currently in the works to help campus first responders deal with students showing signs of mental health problems? Um, I'll go ahead and answer that. And thank you for the question. Um, one of our initiatives this year, we, we looked at committees and task forces uh, to address specific problems and, and issues on our college university campuses. And we had formed a, uh, uh, a mental health task force uh, this year to help us with uh, doing research, um, working with the National Center for Campus Public Safety, identifying issues, and, and helping uh, campus public safety respond to these types of incidents. So it's in its infancy right now for this year, but uh, uh, certainly something that we're, we're very committed to. Great. Thank you. I do have another question. Among those with whom you coordinate, how do you bring students into the process, such as letting them know about the emergency plan? I'll go ahead and take that question. Um, and I appreciate the question. You know, students are obviously a very, very important part of our community. Um, and you know, we serve as educators outside the classroom. It's important to go ahead and have our students working with us um, to help them understand the need for emergency plans, what to do when events happen, and, and how they can assist us. And the more knowledge that they have the, um, you know, in responding to incidents and in preparing, um, you know, the better that uh, they'll, they'll be able to help us. Um, and you know, we have student um, employees, uh, many of our departments do, so to the extent that we can also include them in training, in uh, awareness opportunities, those educational opportunities, uh, the better prepared we all are. Calvin, did you want to add to that? I believe, the, thank you, uh, Director Weaver. I think uh, from the federal level, we have tried our best to develop some resources that will be able to more get students involved in the process. Obviously, I think a lot of most colleges and universities realize that students need to be more involved there, but it's not always an easy thing to get them involved. So we're definitely trying to resource that as best that we can. Thank you. Another question we have is, should the continuity of operations plan be part of this plan or be separate? Mm, good question. I would say that they need to be separate because they achieve two different separate purposes. One is internal in general, a coup plan is internal to the, to the university. We have emergency operation plan is definitely more encompassing and involves external as well as internal uh, all the time. Uh, does that sound uh, good? Uh, and, and I would agree with that, too. All okay. Any other questions, Amy? I believe we have one more question. Okay. Is there a central clearinghouse for sample protocols for various problems that might arise on campus? Um, I can respond to that. 
As a matter of fact, IACLEA has model documents and protocols available to its members. And we also have an interactive email list that allows our members to ask questions and um, other members to supply answers on a daily basis. So for example, a college chief might ask whether, uh, about weather-related evacuation protocols. And a chief at a university in the hurricane zone, hurricane zone uh, might supply an answer based on his or her, her experience. So these questions are posed to the entire membership through its listserv um, as resources and also as responses. Um, also, I want to mention, too, that the, the uh, National Center for Campus Public Safety, um, funded through the Justice Department, has as its goal the collection of existing materials on best practices and sample documents that can be useful for any number of situations that might arise on campus, including emergencies. So there are resources out there that are available. And keeping in mind that the National Center for Campus Public Safety is a developing resource. It's not a currently available, but the, all the things that Director Weaver said will definitely be available uh, relatively soon. OK, I don't, wait, let me have one more question. Um, no, those are all the questions I have at the moment. We can see if anybody wants to send in anything real quickly. And if there are any more questions, I will turn it back over to my colleagues at the REMS TA Center. Sean? Thanks, Amy. Um, and thanks, everyone, for participating in our webinar and Q&A session. We hope that today's presentation provided you with a better understanding of campus public safety. We invite you to visit the REMS TA Center website at http. Dot, I mean, HTTP colon slash slash rems.ed.gov to view or share the archived webinar, access the collaborative guides, and or find resources pertaining to campus public safety, as well as additional resources, publications, and trainings to help you in your emergency operations planning efforts for schools and institutions of higher education. The resources on the REMS TA Center website support the development of comprehensive emergency operations plans for schools and IAGs. Our searchable resource repository contains proven practices, tools, and other items developed by school emergency managers pertinent to the needs of local education agencies and IAGs as they engage in the process of emergency operation planning. Downloadable copies of the guides for developing high-quality school and IAG emergency operations plans are also available on the website. Archives of past webinars, including those providing an overview of the guides, as well as on special topics such as threat assessment, infectious diseases, and lockdown and evacuation procedure are also available. The guides and resources are available now in the resources section of the site, and the archive presentation and other supporting documents for today's webinar will be available in the webinars section in approximately five to seven business days. We also maintain a dedicated electronic mail address and a toll-free telephone number, 1-855-781-REMS, or 7367, by which requests for technical assistance on topics pertaining to emergency operations planning for schools and IHEs may be submitted. Thank you again for joining us today. This concludes the webinar. <laughs>